Sanders, what's up, man? Hey, how are you doing? How's life? Oh, man, everything's great. Everything's awesome. How are you? Good. Everything's good, man. Where are you located? I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. Okay. I need to get to the Carolinas. I'm in Kansas City, so, um, but I need to get down in that part of the world. Excellent. Well, we'd love to see you down here. Come on down. Do you guys do boiled peanuts there? Uh, I mean, that's more of a South Carolina thing, but yeah, you can find them for sure. Okay. Because the first time I saw those... You know, because coming from Kansas City, if, if peanuts have been soaking in water, you throw them out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, the best part is you go down the small country highways and you look for the little roadside stands with the iron kettle pots. And that's yeah. But I, I had them. I think we were leaving Florida and I had some. But the first time I saw it, it was just like a spaceship landed and i was like what are these weird creatures <laughs> <laughs> well you either love them or you hate them yeah it's actually one of my few memories of my ha my grandmother who grew up in the south country of of uh, of uh, south carolina and um she used to boil green peanuts all the time and i just okay. remember eating them on her green vinyl couch okay uh, the low country of south carolina sorry <laughs> that's cool that's a great grandmother uh uh memory to have for sure so well, man, it's great to meet you. Thank you for taking a minute out today. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So before we get into your newest album, I want to know, you know, four years ago, this pandemic just erased everything for musicians through everything into uncertainty. How did you survive the pandemic and how did it either influence this album or change the way that you do things now? Oh, wow. What such a great, great question. Well, I mean, let me start with the last piece, how it influenced how I do things now. Um, I never realized how much I relied on the psycho-spiritual connection but of music between artists, meaning playing with other people physically, like in, in a present space. And that was the thing that really kind of hit me the hardest was not being able to play music with others. Um, and I did, it was something that I was aware of in terms of like, you know, psychic connections, but I wasn't, I'd never been without it since I started playing you know publicly at around 15 years old and to have it be completely gone was the thing that just kind of like really threw me into a tailspin you know um it heavily influenced this record i had started sort of working on it prior to the well i mean the writing goes back decades but you know it was starting to formulate but i came out of the pandemic and really put the put the energy into making this it just i felt i it it I found found it very compelling to complete the project. You know, the, the the pandemic really left me with a feeling of impermanence, which is kind of like the overarching theme of what the record is all about. So it made me really want to push through and like make it complete the project, make the art, like actually get it out into the world. So it was a real catalyst for for productivity. Well, and it has a real, um, like you said, there's 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 a level of um non-permanence i mean the black and white photo um is that you on the front that is my father and he actually died passed away during the making of the record okay. um and my sister was down visiting with some family and came home with a stack of old photographs and as soon as i saw that photograph i was like well there it is you know i i love art and have a lot of friends that are visual artists and how it was was mentally going down a completely different path but then when i found that photograph i was like it just it just speaks of timelessness in a way but also pays on tribute to him in a, in a really subtle way that's meaningful to me it's interesting because you know i look through like my dad's old photos and all of that like when you used to have a camera you didn't have that many shots and i think right. about standing next to a car and it's like you got to do it right <laughs> there's no like cell phone camera where if you blink your eye it's like you got to be on your game <laughs> to just take mm -hmm. a simple picture you know and, and, you know, it was kind of a game of patience back then as well, because there wasn't instant gratification of seeing the photograph. You had to wait till, till it got developed, yeah. you know, especially back that photograph was taken, I think in 1950, he was eight to 10 years old. He was born in 1941, 1942, I think, but, um, uh, yeah, so 50, 51, he was about 10 years old is what I was told in that photograph. But, um, so, you know, he had his photograph taken, had no idea what it was going to you know what it was going to look like 
you know. Yeah. It's a, patience is a virtue, you know. <laughs> Absolutely, for sure. So what are you hoping the listener gets from this album? So my, I, I have really kind of two thoughts on that. Um, I, I love to tell stories and I love to tell stories both in the individual songs and over the arc of the, of the record as a whole. Um, I respect that in the modern in music world we stream so individual songs have their own lifespan now and that we're kind of back to the world of singles but i also still love the idea of the record and the album especially in the jazz genre i feel like there's there's still room for it to make an artistic statement as a whole so every single song on the record has a story behind it um and i also feel that the the long arc from beginning to end also tells a compelling story um and as i already mentioned and we've talked about a little bit you know the 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 feeling is in the meaning of the word evanescent the i just the idea of impermanence and and as we've already kind of discussed lightly it's it came out of the pandemic it came out of my father dying it came out of um actually one band that i had been in for about 20 four years was ending during the time of this um of the making of this record so th there were lots of feelings of i don't like to think of it as loss so much as just transformation you know like yeah. things moving into different states of being and that kind of thing because loss kind of implies i don't know it's it's like you know positive and negative are, are exist within it, each other so you know i don't really want to think of it i don't want to paint it being the idea of it being a loss as much as it is being transformed into something else to me that's the idea of imp impermanence um, is the idea of change well it's interesting you know as we get older there's these things that just kind of naturally change it's almost kind of scientific like we think when we're kids that things are so much bigger like when i went and saw my childhood home that i grew up in everything was small as an adult you know, mm -hmm. but when you're a kid, it's big and it's forever and it's permanent, you know, and that's the thing when you get older and you start seeing the the passage of seasons and how people leave and how all of these things transpire. People you went to high school with that that aren't here anymore. There's so much of that just soaks into your bones and makes mm -hmm. you realize it's kind of like jazz. I mean, there's a level of jazz that like happens once and it's gone. It's like in the vapor. It's like dissipated. And it's kind of that idea. Absolutely. hundred percent. You know, it's, I, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee and uh, surrounded in the music scene over there. And I actually was thinking this morning, I had an old friend visit me a couple of weeks ago that I went, that I'd known since sixth grade. And he said a bunch of names to me that I hadn't thought about in a long time, that there were, there were people that I had grown up with. And, and when we were in high school, we used to spend a lot of time uh, kind of being hooligans a little bit, but behind the um, university school in Nashville, there was a giant wooden playground, which I have since been back and it just looks like a normal adult playground. But when I was younger, I was thinking this morning and meditating about the ideas of how of the social structure, like the names of these people and thinking about how we related to each other when we were kids and how big this this playground seemed. And we would run around and play chase and tag and hide, you know, hide and go seek and all these kinds of things. We would improvise with each other in our games, if you will. And it just like really dawned on me how much um, structural cultural shifts occur just as we age, you know, and, and our perception of them occur because now we're all peers if you will in our own way but back then we had hierarchies or perceptions of hierarchy even if we all had our own perceptions of reality and and you know if we transcend that into concepts of jazz i mean even when improvising we all have our own perception of reality and our own perceptions of harmony and we you know the best most sublime improvisations are when those when those you know perceptions meld into like a, a whole that really makes a harmonic sense you know or, or a dialogue which is what i enjoy the most about improvising with my with my colleagues is, is is when we really get conversations going you know so you'd mentioned growing up in nashville music city usa but more specifically to you when did you decide that you were going to get into music and more specifically getting getting into jazz Oh man, I mean, I've always I've been into music since I was born. I don't remember a specific moment. I've always been drawn to it. Um, it just it was just something that always got my attention, and I paid attention to. I, my stepfather, when I was young, 
was very much into classical music. So I grew up listening to a lot of WPLN, which was the local Nashville at the time classical music station. And he introduced me to, to Mozart and to Vivaldi and Brahms and to all these great composers. So from an early age, I was just completely overwhelmed and entranced, entranced by the, the compositional scus and the scope of these of, of this writing. Um, as I started playing, um, I started out as a guitar player. I really was, you know, went through the same kind of like, you know, high school explorations of music that a lot of us do and was drawn towards guitar players. But I just was, I think it was the compositional elements of jazz tied with the feeling and soulfulness of like rock and blues and all that, that really kind of pulled me into it. But then there was like the whole like intellectual theoretical side. And as I studied stylistic music, I came to the thought process that if you could learn jazz and the theory underlying it, then you would have a gateway into playing any style that you wanted to play. And that's what really led me down the path of wanting to study, not just jazz, but actually like, kind of ethnomusicology in a way just to study the stylistic boundaries of all these different styles of all over the world and, and, and how to combine those musics together. Um, and that's what I, what I really enjoy the most is, you know, and it relates into my whole theory of storytelling because you can, you know, you can really like get into music and understand how to like, you know, how one thing might be told in, in, you know, Saharan Africa versus how it might be told in the British Isles versus how it might be told in Louisiana, USA, you know, those are all very different but relatable music fields, you know, so that's a long, a very circuitous way to answer that question. No, that's good. No, I like it. I like it. It really fills in gaps. What was the first live show that you saw that blew you away that made you think and solidified the, the fact that you wanted to be up there one day doing that? Wow. Oh, uh, so I guess there's two answers to that. I mean, my first concert I ever saw was Michael Jackson's Victory Tour at the at Nayland Stadium in Knoxville. Um, and I mean, just the just the showmanship yeah. blew me away. And it wasn't that I wanted to be on the stage because I wanted to be Michael Jackson. It, I wanted to be on the stage because that was like just witnessing the power of how the energy was being transferred between the the performers and the audience and the and just the the give and take and the flow of the whole thing you know was just overwhelming you know um and then you know growing up in nashville so i mean the first concert i probably saw that i would give that meaning to was probably a band called shadow facts which was an old windham hill band um kind of from the new age world but i grew up really being surrounded by the music of Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones. I saw, you know, hundreds of their shows in my formative years. Also Colonel Bruce Hampton and the Aquarium Rescue Unit, um, which was kind of like a jazz rock fusion kind of concept. I would go see these bands a lot when I was young and they, especially Colonel Bruce would, he was really tied into the Sun Ra world and um, I eventually fell into being able to study with Reggie Wooten, um, Victor Wooten's oldest brother, and um, and and ended up in Knoxville, studying at UT Knoxville because I, I went there because of Jerry Coker. I stayed because of a guy named Samurai Celestial, who was Sun Ra's drummer for many years. And between Reggie and Samurai, they were the ones who really kind of like got my mind separated from my soul or, or it showed me the difference and showed me to like use the power of the mind and the intellect to learn skills and techniques, but then to use the soul and the spirit of the universe to actually find your way into the actual, what the music actually meant. Yeah. And that was kind of how I ended up where I am today. It's interesting. My dad was a car salesman and he won tickets to that victory tour. And yeah. <laughs> it was an Arrowhead Stadium, and it just, it was mind-blowing, just everything you said. Like, I remember they were really late, and we just kept watching these cars pulling backstage. Like, is this it? Is this it? <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, he comes out of that little hole in the ground, like he kind of did in the Pepsi commercial. And that yep. sequin glove came out, and it just shone on everybody, and girls were fainting. It was crazy. <laughs> so, yep. yeah. Absolutely. It, it was wonderful. So, talk to me a little bit about 
what do you like the best about being a professional musician? What ultimately gets you out of bed every day? What has motivated you to do the music that you have evolved into over all these years? Um, a creative drive to uh, for self expression, um, and a, and a and a you know that I like to say that one of the through lines in my life's work has always been like cultivating and crafting space for community and space for creativity. Um, earlier, you asked how I survived as a pan through the pandemic as a as a musician. I um, I mean, one of the side effects of growing up in Nashville was that I saw from a very early age a lot of some of the most amazing musicians I'd ever known really struggling as they got into their older years because, you know, music in a lot of ways, depending on the genre, is a young man's game or a young person's game because, you know, it's, it, 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 it's you know, especially as time has gone on, it's just a very challenging industry to be in. So I diversified um uh, at a younger age, I've, I've spent years in technology. I also own or am a co-owner in two different bars here in Asheville, one of which hosts live music and live jazz weekly. Um, and so that the point of telling you this is that I've created I, I feel compelled to create these spaces for people to get together and share their creative experiences with each other, whether that be as an artist or whether that be as an audience member. And I feel compelled to just facilitate that so that we can have a scene as a community and as an art, as an art community and as a, as a, you know, a, a society, if you will. Um, so that's what drives me a lot is wanting to, you know, help foster this spirit of creativity within our society. Um, you know, one thing for better or worse about American society is that we have to work within the private sector for the most part in order to create these spaces. There is public sector funding, but it's not as as robust as it is in a lot of other countries and a lot of other communities, um, which is really commonly seen in the jazz world because it's really easy for artists to find support in other places. Um, and then we come back to the States and we have to work really hard. So I like to try to work both sides I feel like creating that holistic environment really benefits everyone. I'm a big believer in rising tides and boats and all that kind of thing, you know? So, um, so that's what really drives me, you know, and then as an artist, I feel as if I get to drink from the same well, you know, if I, if I spend my time, a lot of my time helping to dig and build the well, then I will also get to share from the sweet water. And so I, spend a lot of my i'm really compelled to do that and and feel like that's a really important part but that at the end of the day though i i love to swim in this spiritual psychic fountain that is music and i love to swim in that great lake of transformation with all of my friends and colleagues and that's what i live for honestly i mean that's what i love to do um and so yeah, yeah, I dig it. So of everything that you've done in your life and evolved into at this point, what are you the proudest of? Um, two things. One is to is literally the continuation of what I just said. I'm really proud. Of the bar that I have here in um, Asheville is called Little Jumbo. We have live music two nights a week. We do it on Mondays and Tuesdays. And I am just really proud of the community that has been formed around it and cultivated through it both the audience and the artists i love how diverse it is i love how we bring in people from all off walks of life it's a small thing in the grand scheme of things but even the smallest thing can have the biggest impact and i'm just truly grateful to everyone in our community for that for the opportunity to not only help create this but for their participation in it um and then i really am truly just um, and when I use the word pride, I, I mean it with humility. I'm just grateful for the opportunity to have created this record, Evanescent. I feel like, you know, my work as an artist up until this moment in my life right now, sitting here speaking with you, is really well encapsulated in that album. Um, I've worked for years, decades as a sideman and as, um, you know, supporting and, and helping to build other people's music. And I'm really proud of all of that work, but this record represents who I am and who, what, how I see the musical world and my 
worldview. And I mean, it, when you listen to it, it will go all the way from really organized, beautiful music to complete and total chaos and deconstructs itself in a way that it creates a, a sense of entropy that really I, is how I see nature organizing itself. But um, I'm just proud of it and humbled by how how accurately in the end it was able to represent how I see music. You know, I set out with an artistic vision and I feel like I actually realized it. Um, and we, we, we staged it about in July of 2024, we staged this record. Um, and I feel like that moment was a moment of transformation for myself, shifting from being a supporting artist to actually being a true band leader and actually being able to represent my own art. Um, but one thing that's always important to me is to make sure that every voice that's in any ensemble is equal and is valued. And, and so we staged it with a nine piece band because it takes that many horns, you know, but we, I still feel as if it was great to give voice to all, to everyone on that stage. And, and I am equally as, as humbled by that and by everyone's participation. So if anyone wants to pick up Evanescent or catch you live, go to your clubs, what's the best way to do that? Mindtonicmusic.com. M-I-N-D-T-O-N-I-C music.com. Um, it represents me as an individual, but it also represents all of my musical interests. Um, you know, uh, we're, I'm working with a small label, helping to build actually my one of my I have partners, but we're, we're going to release a series of live records from Little Jumbo. Uh, the first one hopefully coming out at the end, of the end of the year, so you'll be able to find out about that there and in everything that I'm doing. Okay, excellent. Jay, thank you, sir. This has been wonderful. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the music and for the spirit that you put out there for the music. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm truly grateful. Thank you. Yes, sir. Before you go, I...